And with that, we start. Uh, welcome to everyone on such a beautiful evening. Um, this is uh, Turning the Tide on Climate. Uh, last week, we talked about renewables, and tonight we're talking about rewilding Earth. My name is Clark Mackey, if you're, if you're new here, and tonight I'm going to be co-hosting with Leslie Rudy. Um, uh, you know the routine by now, type your questions into the chat and uh, there'll be quite a chunk of time at the end. Um, Joyce is going to probably speak for about 15 or 20 minutes and, uh, and then there'll be lots of time for you to um, read, read your questions from the chat. For, give her lots of time to answer them. Uh, the seminar is being recorded and it will be uploaded in the next couple of days to the 350 Kingston website. Uh, there's our email address if you need it. Um, and as usual, uh, we want to uh, take a minute to think about where we are and to acknowledge the issue of settler colonialism and uh, its relationship to climate change, the topic of one of the topics of tonight's presentation. Uh, Kingston is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. It's my pleasure to introduce Joyce Houston. Um, she is a master gardener and permaculture designer. She coaches people on foodscaping and wildscaping as a new approach to gardening in a changing climate. She helped design and plant Kingston's first two public food forests. And now she has set her sights on afforesting the city with indigenous little forests, which is something uh, which I think she's going to talk about tonight. Uh, so welcome, Joyce. I'm just, I just stopped staring, so you can take over sharing the, the screen. Okay, thank you, Clark, and hi, everybody. Wish me luck because I worked on this right until the last second. Um, okay. Rewilding Earth. That's the big topic I'm talking about, but am I really talking about rewilding Earth? This is a little weevil. Back. Oops, sorry. In 1545, villagers in, a, in France, they sought appropriate measures because the weevil had attacked their vineyards and they wanted it exp them expunged. And they took the weevil to court and the court ruled that as creatures of God, those weevils possess the same rights as the villagers to consume, to consume the grapes. So a compromise was suggested and they were relocated to another vineyard outside of the disputed village one. Plants and humans are having some major relationship issues. This is what Timothy Murray in Plant Practice says, and I would agree with them. This is, I think, one of the big reasons for our climate crisis is our relationship issues with Earth. And headlines like making biofuels cheaper by putting plants to work just reinforce that attitude. Ursula Le Guin in one of her novels, imagine this, do you realize the final linguist will say to the aesthetic critic that once upon a time they couldn't even read eggplant. Just imagine us humans not being able to read eggplant. They will smile in our ignorance. As they pick up their rucksacks and hike up on up to read the newly deciphered lyrics of the lichen on the north face of Pike's Peak. We, our communication abilities with plants are pretty minimal right now. Bruno Latour, who has a book called, I think it's Becoming Terrestrial, says, what, why is it that we invented a way of not being on Earth? And his argument is that we have to become terrestrial again. We have to come down, back down to Earth. High tech to the rescue. We hear that a lot. We've I've been hearing a lot about drones and, and billions of trees being planted by drones. And high tech is where all the money and where all the focus is being poured. Imagine all these little poor pines. Seriously, you expect eight species that, that 
eight species now that drones are talking about. They're starting with four. Typically, they plant at one in monocultures, and now they're looking at four and maybe up to eight. But as Clark mentioned, we're planting little forests in Kingston. And in our little forest, there's going to be 35 to 50 species in 100 square meters. Eight species is not going very nearly far enough. Robin Wall Kimmer had a really, really harsh uh, article a year or so back where she started it, America Colonists, Allies and Ancestors Yet to Be. Plantational scene refers to a certain historically specific way of appropriating the land, namely an appropriation of land as if land was not there. The plantational scene is a historical desoilization of the earth. And that's Bruno Latour again. We tamed the wilderness, we civilized the land, we made it productive, and we put its natural resources to good use. That's how we saw, as colonists, what we were doing. And we're still doing it, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We can help, we have a solution to feeding Africa and they're bringing in GMO and drones and uh, large agriculture. The world that Bill and Linda Gates, the world of the colonists, isn't the world. There's many worlds out there, and yeah, there's many worlds out there. And we have to stop trying to impose one world, the one world world, on all these other, all these places on the landscape. So these solutions, solutions like the high tech drones, like um, feeding Africa. What is the story that underlies the solutions that emerge out of that? And I won't really go into this, but it, it really starts with a, and then this has come up throughout the series. Economy is the story that everything is based upon. But that story is not everyone's story. There's stories in different worlds around the world and where economy in this case, it's a different type of economy with this maybe slash and burn in the, the Kalaman culture, where gardening and there's no division of labor and a gift economy. Luther Standing Bear said, we did not think of the great open plains, the beautiful rolling hills and the winding streams with tangled growth as wild. Earth was bountiful and we were surrounded with the blessings of the great mystery. Not until the hairy man from the east came and with brutal frenzy heaped injustices upon us and the families we loved was it wild for us. Wild is a concept that didn't used to exist. And the very fact that we have a word for nature is evidence that we do not regard ourselves as part of it. And speaking of other worlds or worlds that I don't want to be part of, Mars base, Mars base alpha colonization extending out to Mars. Isn't it time we come down, down to Earth? Robin Wall Kimmer says that native people have a different term for public lands. We call them home. We call them our sustainer, our library, our pharmacy, our sacred places. We need to think about what we are making, not simply as tools to do our bidding, but rather as co-inhabitants of the same complex ecosystem, ecological system in which we all live. And that's Anab Jane. She's talking about actually technology. Um, and the drones, one of the drone companies I saw modeled themselves after birds pooping and birds poop um, seeds, which plants trees and plants fish and plants all kinds of things. So rewilding, is rewilding coming to the rescue? Fencing out the humans. And that, I, I find that to be one of the real strong streams of rewilding. Wolves are I'm not your salvation. Well, they do help. The elk population stay under control is apex predators, the rewilding solution that we're looking at. Robin Wall Kimmerer again, you right now can choose to set aside the mindset of the colonizer and become native to place. You can choose to belong. That's my sense of rewilding, choosing to belong. Right now, we're in the third moon of creation. Onabadin, Onabadin, snow crust moon, Onabadin, Jesus. What are the stories of the landscape that we call home? So this we now call home, as settlers we call this home, but do we really know the stories 
the stories of the peoples, the stories of the beings, the stories of the trees, the stories of the insects that lived here and that live here now. A landscape, and when we talk rewilding, we talk about landscapes. A landscape is a multi-species gathering in the making. I love that definition of landscape, a multi-species gathering in the making. And multi-species I'm going to mention a few times here. A leaf, a leaf is a landscape. And, and Hitnach Han says, when we look deeply into the leaf, we can see many things, the plant, the sunshine, the clouds, earth, we have to be aware that a leaf is made of non-leaf elements. If we remove the non-leaf elements, such as the sun, the clouds, and the soil, there will be no leaf left. Forest floor is a landscape. Rotten grass become fireflies. That's one of the Japanese micro seasons. If we clean up the forest floor, there are no fireflies, there are no bees. I am landscape, people are landscapes. The human body is a multiplicity that doesn't end with the skin. We think about humans as the separate self, but we aren't, we are landscapes as well of millions of beings. We breathe the earth, the earth breathes us. We're completely interconnected. We are not separate. There is no nature apart from us. There was a, I watched a little video today, which was hilarious. It's a little boy whose cat died and buried his cat. And he imagined the whole process of the cat and burying the cat and the maggots eating that, in the, the cat and then the maggots turning into flies and the flies pooping in the soil and the cow eating the plants that grew in the soil, milking the cow, drinking the milk, and then the cat is part of him. Breath means community, breath means sharing, meaning yourself, be imagined by others, humans by non-human others, others by non-animate others, as stone and sand and air. So Wiley is not about a return to a past without humans. Rewilding is about restoring the messiness of interspecies relationships, those multi-species relations that came up earlier. Here's Jeff Vandermeer. He's a fantasy author, but he's hilarious. He's been rewilding his yarn ever since uh, Trump got elected. And he has uh, long conversations with the different species in his yarns for Jesse the Rabbit. He interferes with some of his plans. This idea of rewilding, by which I mean this rich regeneration of place, a possibility of hope, a thriving of diversity as opposed to monoculture. This is a cultural as well as an ecological project and it's one that celebrates diversity. I really like Robert McFarland's definition of rewilding, regeneration of place, possibility, hope, multi-species thriving. It's the earthy, untamed, undomesticated state of things, open-ended, improvisational, moving according to its own boisterous logic. That which is wild is not really out of our out of control, it is simply out of our control. Wildness is not a state of disorder, but a condition of disorder is not imposed from outside. Wild land follows its own order, its own Tao, its own inherent way in the world. gatherings of ways of being in the making. So a farm is a landscape and how a farmer chooses to farm is with multi-species in a multi-species um, relationship or in an attempt to control. And when a farm I think is in a multi-species relationship, then I would call it rewilding. Take a bee eyes, bee eyes view of squash bees Squash is a domesticated plant, but we have specialist native squash bees that have co-evolved with the squash and squash was dom domesticated by indigenous peoples in North America eons ago. How do we engage not just people, but also birds, mice, fish, bees, mushrooms, and trees in rewilding? So rewilding isn't about people. So things that I've kind of, as I think through this, and I'm still thinking through this, I think this is like a lifelong thing to think through, 
But when I started, I was thinking, how do I think see this thing and this thing being a tree? And how and now I'm sitting here, how does this asking the question, how does this being see themselves and their world? So mine, just like um, the colonists coming over to North America saying mine, you know, I do this with my home when I move into my home. And normal, what's the definition of normal? A normal front yard of monoculture grass yard. What do other beings on the land think? A squirrel, a squirrel prefers forest. So there becomes a negotiation. And my shift to thinking about trees and all the other around us as beings from it comes from Robin Wall Kimmer originally when I read Graining Sweetgrass. And she says of Apple, we must say, who is that being? And we reply, and sorry, I can't pronounce this yet. Mishmin Yahweh, Apple, that being is. We must say Yahweh when it's a being. So then you ask questions about how does this being see themselves in this situation when you meet somebody wild? How do I understand walnutiness? They have needs, they have gifts, they have behaviors, they have relationships and family and language and animating breath and spirit and characteristics. They want to become, they, they yearn for life too. And so what does black walnut want? What world making activities? Every creature, everything is making worlds and we're all in negotiation with our world making. This is a Luna moth and they live with black walnuts. This is a wild plum in my yard, which I had tried to eradicate several times before I actually stopped, paused and asked it, asked it, see, I still say it, asked who it was and learned that it's wild plum. And uh, why am I trying to tell wild plum you're not welcome? And now wild plum is welcome. I'm introducing getting to know. Daisy Hilljard says the ash tree, the more I looked at it, I saw it place. So another, a landscape, about it as a landscape, other lives. Gavin Van Horn says that one conception of wildness is simply an acknowledgement that the land has a will of its own. So um, wildness can be a yard, it can be your home. It can be, it can be the city. We can have wildness in the city. Well, this is a question that begins a dialogue with the land. So it's a conversation with the land. What does the land want to be? Who does the land want to become? And Robin Wall Kimmer had a great set of questions, which I've modified slightly. And she came up with these questions for thinking about invasive species. But they're not just relevant for invasive species, I think. I think they're relevant to any time you meet another plant being. Here's some things to ask. A second shift that I've been working on is from planting trees to fight climate change, to conspiring with forests to create refugia for multi-species resurgence. So multi-species resurgence is what it's about. It's not about fighting climate change, although climate change and doing something about that is an outcome. Going to an out, uh, go to a nearby outside area. And so what do we have to do when we do this? Do we have to change the world or do we just need to go to a nearby area and really get to know an area, get to know a pond, get to know the forest that I walk in every day, get to know the beings who live in your yard, allow new beings to come in and introduce yourself to them. Ask what those beings want. What does ant want? Getting to know ant. We've, and when I first moved into my yard, I try and eradicate the ant hills because they would disrupt the plants. The plants wouldn't grow where the ants were, but really the ants were um, aerating the soil. They were doing fabulous things. And this is a blood root seed. Many of the forest plants, it's only because of ants that the seeds spread, the ants, the seed is coated with something very tasty. So the ants haul them over to their 
ant holes and um, bury them as after they eat them. And we have blood root, we have trillions, they're spreading around. And that's from the ants making their old world. Oops. So asking what ant wants, asking what forests want, what forest, what world making activities does a forest make? And about humans, what world making activities do humans perform? And there's no such thing as one type of human. So we say Anthropocene, and there's a lot of criticism about that term because it's not humans as a whole. It's one world making activity of a certain portion of the human population. So humans in charge, trees and mines, soil is planting media, lonely trees, exotic males, clones, single layer canopy, colonizes the iron control. how we see trees in cities right now. We don't have forests in cities for the most part. And as a kind of a landscape doesn't have to be a understood as being either territory or scenery, it can be conceived as a new nexus of community, justice, nature, and environmental equity, a contested territory. And so look at forests coming in and taking over city. So for in city and the little forests that we're planting, think about them as multi-species relationships, entangled species with each, species entangled with each other, including humans, Soil is kin, kinship clusters indigenous to place. So as I mentioned, there's like 35 to 50 species in each little forest, multi-layers. The beauty is rooted in place rather than colonized aesthetic and it invites gratitude. We don't control the forest asks us for gratitude. So this little forest lakeside, so you can see it's not a little forest right now. And here's some of the questions. <clears throat> Here's some of the questions that I've been thinking about. How do, what questions do we ask when we meet a new place? Before we plant, before we decide to be a disturbance in place. Because for me, rewilding isn't about stepping back and staying away because humans are part of wild. Humans themselves can be wild or are wild. So it's more in that multi-species negotiation um, the negotiation with place. And here's some of the questions to ask. Ursula Le Guin, she said animals were once more to us than meat pests or pets. They were fellow creatures, colleagues, dangerous equals. And so were plants. So fellow creatures, colleagues, dangerous equals. Wel welcome to the, I'm going to, Catulacine? Catulacine. I was practicing that word, but still don't quite have it. The Greek Cathonius ca 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 means of inner under the earth and sea. The earthbound can take heart as well as action. So Bruno Latour is saying it's time for us to come down to earth to reconnect with earth and be of the earth. Donna Haraway's use of this word Cathonian is about stepping away from the notion of the Anthropocene and becoming engaged in a multi-species relationship with Earth. So in the Cthulhu scene, making and recognizing kin is perhaps the hardest and most urgent challenge humans in and of the Earth face today. Making kin, um, cultures and, and nations around the world, they have had no concept of that meant wilderness. Land is granted the same love, and in this, um, one of the main, or one of the main cultures, I think this was from, land was granted the same love and affection as family. Ethnoecologist Enrique Salomon, himself, uh, Tara Humara, calls it kin-centric ecology. We are immersed in an environment where we are at equal standing with the rest of the world. We are equal, we're not above, as you often see humans on top in this pyramid. So all the other beings are kindred relations, the trees, the rocks, the bugs, and everything, equal. So thinking and acting from a symbiotic perspective, making kin with fungi, bacteria, all the species of life. And I said, all humans aren't alike, a farmer and a financier. 
um, racehorse and a plant horse and different horse enactments. They make different worlds. Rock and water have historically shifting ways of being. So in landscape moot, ways of being emerge and shape what's possible for all the others. And so this, some might call it a forest. I think around the world, we're still planting things like this and calling them forests. It's one form of forest, but really I would call it a plantation. So you have to start from place, whoever, whatever clan you are, you start from your own land and then you sing, you sing what's there in your land. And here's my yard kind of edging over to the neighbor's yard. Monocultures, monocultures, multi-species coming in and do we let them? So stepping into wildness, ecological aesthetics. In this case, I'd call that rewilding David Haskell and the Songs of Trees, not a retreat into an imagined wilderness where humans have no place, but a step towards belonging in all dimensions. Step into relationship, the magic of a relationship, relationship with the birds, the relationship with the insects. So many people don't realize when they spray the insects and the, the moths that are eating things, that those insects, those babies, are what feed the birds, which is what feed, who feed the babies. Farming, we're not the only ones who farm. Anna Galloway, Anne Galloway's in New Zealand, and she has the More Than Human lab there. And More Than Human research is, is starting to I think it's in the early stages of really disrupting academics, a whole bunch of the different disciplines like anthropology, law, there's a whole bunch of them that more than human and other than human is being discussed. But she has sheep, so that's her more than human lab as part of or related to her sheep farm. And she will continually share her stories about how she, her worldviews have changed because of her relationship with sheep and vice versa. So what is magic? In the deepest sense, magic is an experience, the experience of finding oneself alive within a world that is itself alive. The experience of contact and community between oneself and something that is profoundly different from oneself, a swallow, a frog, a spider weaving its web. So enchantment, magic, enchantment, re-enchantment, rewilding is re-enchanting, seeing the magic that's all around us. This spider, this is a garden spider. I never really noticed or looked at spiders too closely before. And this was at the garden at Lakeside. So Joyce, I think the, your um, thing is uh, so, um, stop. stopped. Uh, yeah, yeah, this slideshow has stopped. Well, almost at the end of it, which is good then. Is, oh, I only have two or three left. Or, do you uh, want to do the last couple then, Clark? Um, I or it doesn't really matter. You don't need to actually see the last couple. <laughs> All right, so you can just talk us through it. All right. Yeah, Let's I'll go. just talk you to it because we're basically done anyway. Well, we went pretty far before it stopped. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd warn Clark that my Zoom is having issues with sometimes randomly failing to pass the slides through. But landscape, so just to end, like landscape, think about landscape as an incredibly mystical teacher. And when you begin to tune into its sacred presence, something shifts inside of you. An acorn. And I like thinking about acorn or walnut because that is the start of a tree. It's a story. There's a story unfolded in, in an acorn. There's a story unfolded in a walnut. And one acorn, one walnut can become a tree, a forest, and it become a world, a, new, a landscape, a multi-species gathering. So ending with a quote from Bayou Akoma Lafi saying that this is not a question of rejoining nature. And this is a question of recognizing we are nature. We are wild in its ongoing complexity. So we are wild. We have forgotten that in our, well, we have allowed ourselves to be domesticated. So I think rewilding is really Throwing off, and I think this is where the word composting comes in. That composting our worldviews, composting the way we live in landscape, 
and rethinking that and, and just starting forests, starting restoring streams, allowing lawns to grow wild. I don't know if that's, if that's how I'll end it, I guess, because I don't know. I'm feeling like I'm just leaving it hanging here. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. That's, that, that's very thoughtful. And, and those quotes are very, are really inspiring. Um, I'm going to, we're going to go to some, there some questions in a minute, but I, ju I just want to, um, I know that you are, one of the things that you do in Kingston is you're trying to um, create these multi-species entanglements within the yes. city. Uh, in, in a variety of ways, starting with your own backyard and front yard, uh, and then uh, lakeside garden and uh, uh, the food forests, and, and now the, the little forest, with which we're hoping to get uh, two or three this summer. Um, and I guess my question to you to sort of bring it back around to Kingston and, and, and the, the situation is, is what what are what kind of infrastructure or or legislative or um, uh, you know uh, social ob obstacles do you come across when you try to rewild in the city? It goes back to uh, that was my husband. You saw there sitting in the chair, and he wasn't looking at a normal front yard anymore, as you can tell. That was a picture from this year but it's getting over the idea of what normal is. And our current definition of normal in our policies that we have, in our approach to needing, to zoning, to permission, that's a colonized normal. And so we need a lot of policy change around, um, around what's possible. And we need to unleash citizens. And uh, and I do have, there's a blog post up on the Master Gardener website about lawns. So if anybody on the call is thinking about rewilding their yard and starting a conversation with the wild in your yard, there is a blog post about um, challenging bylaw complaints. I think it's very, very feasible to do that. And, um, there's actually a movement in Toronto and a lawyer willing to take something on to the Ontario High Courts around um, naturalizing yards because it's, yeah. And then same with like, what's a park? Right now our idea of a park again is this mowed down landscape with lonely trees and we don't welcome other species within it. So if we stop thinking of a park as just for humans and start thinking of the park as a multi-species assemblage um, and that as humans, we want to help, help, I don't know, make it welcoming for those multi-species to help build that community. Um, having, working with the city to, to make community led engagement in parks possible. And there is community gardens now. And um, we are kind of working around the city policy and the city is getting more amenable to it, I think, but the policies still make it difficult. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, a daily struggle. Yeah. Um, all right, um, maybe I'm going to hand it over at this point to Leslie to read some of the uh, questions from the chat. Sure, hi. Um, there's a few questions coming up in the chat. Um, a, a first one, I guess, is um, um, about resources. Um, so you mentioned that there's a blog post on the Master Gardener's website, so maybe there's um, a place to start and a few people are, are also offering their ideas in the chat, but maybe um, are there some key resources um, as far as websites or books or so on that you could point people to if they were looking to um, rewild their spaces? Um, yeah, the Masters Gardeners website, we're really working on that. That's something that we're supporting. Um, and I'm just actually gonna 
for example, with the little forests, um, I've put in the link for that there. We built up the, we're building up the methodology we have in that post that I listed, a species list for four different types of forests. If you wanted to plant a forest in your yard of five layers and here's species that would be companionable with each other. And once they're planted, they'll invite in not just the plant species, but who else may come, all the wildlife that will come because that you, you've done that. And we've got a meadowscaping page. So we've got a wildscaping drop down with that. So I would say that's a, that's a very good resource. And we link to a lot of other resources from there as well. Just to be clear, this is the, the Rideau Thousand Islands oh. Master Gardeners. Yes, the Rita Thousand Islands, not the Toronto one. <laughs> yeah, Kingston is a little odd that way. We're, um, we're, we put a stake in the ground around wildscaping mattering. So we're not, no, we will not recommend pesticides, herbicides, and a lot of the conventional techniques and they're still in the conventional horticulture trade and conventional master gardener training, although more and more master gardeners around are moving away from that as well. Great, thank you. Um, one question you, you did touch on the answer a little bit, but maybe you could expand on um, is, are you or other people working with the city to um, rewild uh, city parks or portions of city parks or other public property? Um, so Lakeside, is I guess it's, it's leased by the city from the prison farm and a little forest we're planting a little forest there this fall and we planted a wildlife hedgerow already there um we're doing it under the under the city's orchard policy so <laughs> we kind of we had to fight that battle saying why we called it as an orchard because they initially turned us down a couple of times before we convinced them and now they're getting more open. So KSX, Kingston Secondary School, they're right beside um, Champlain Park and the teacher librarian there had really wanted to plant a food forest in the front of the school in front of the library. Um, but there's less space there. And now the city's looks like will allow them to use Champlain Park. And there will be a little forest going into Champlain Park this fall as well. So that's the start. But right now the city doesn't have an overall policy. Each one is a battle on its own, a, a special case. So what we need to do is really work with the city to get a policy where they, a policy around like Toronto has a biodiversity policy. So something like that, that is an overall framework that says, this is our vision for parks and we want citizen led engagement for that. Can I just add one thing? Uh, the, the, so I'm involved with the Oak Street Corridor, which is that that um, bicycle and walking path. And there's the Oak Street Garden is in the middle of that. And it's quite a large, long area there. Uh, we were asking them to just stop mowing uh, and let the, the grass grow long and let other kinds of other species grow there. And the, initially they, the city thought, well, they could maybe do that and naturalize it. But now they sort of said, no, they're, they're, they're worried there'll be too many complaints from, from uh, neighbors. And so they're gonna, they're gonna mow it. So this is, <laughs> this is why I say it's a daily struggle. <laughs> yeah, and part of the problem though, isn't just the city. When I met with, I met with the director of Parks and Rec when we were trying to get the exception for Lakeside. And at the time, it was a different park director at the time. And they had said that they had tried to naturalize 20 parks. And by naturalizing, they simply meant not mowing. They not to do anything active, but more of a passive. And it was citizen complaints that made them back off. And now I think they're scared of it. So... I think we have a lot of work to do around changing perceptions of people. And I think this last year, we've seen more wilder yards coming, more wildscaping. And as that happens, and as we have conversations with neighbors, and as we talk about things like, get people excited by bugs. 
I know people are scared of bugs and that gets them excited by bugs and all these creatures and getting, you know, seeing and falling in love with place. And that's why I think building relationship with place is so important. How do we have, how does every citizen build a relationship with plant, with a plant, with a tree, with an insect, with wild beings? Thank you, great answer. Um, the next question is one I was kind of thinking of too, or relates to it, um, is about invasive species um, and how you deal with those. Um, about uh, this, this person's asking if they should just chip them and, and replace with a food forest. Um, but maybe we could expand that question to be more generally, how do you deal with species like buckthorn is the one they mention or other, other problem um, species? And that's a hard one. <laughs> and uh, for the person that's asking about buckthorn, and we have an Ask a Master Gardener call every Thursday at one. And on the website, you can go look and see what's coming up. But Astrid is having two sessions on invasive species, one that's on the shrubs, woody species, and one that's on the, um, the herbaceous ones. And I listened to Robin Wolf. Kimmerer's answer on invasive species. And that's where some of her questions came from. When I mentioned the questions when you meet a new plant being, some of the invasive species like Phragmites, one of the reasons they do so well in those ditches, and those are those tall, for anybody who doesn't know, those tall grasses that you see dominating some of the ditches around. And it, part of the reason they're there is because we're dumping so much phosphorus. Um, phosphorus is running off from um, over fertilization. And so one of the things to do is ask why the species are coming in and maybe we need to make ecological changes. And then, so maybe they're doing us a favor by coming in and cleaning up a disturbance that we've caused. But there's other ones that, so like European buckthorn, there's not gonna be any forest biodiversity if European buckthorn is there. And so I think it's a case by case basis with the invasive species, which ones are, are, are acting as bullies. <laughs> they're, 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 some of them are real bullies and European buckthorn is one. In Robin Wall Kimmer's answers, she, when she talked about garlic mustard and she goes, garlic mustard is not allowed in her forest. She will pull it out there, but she allows it in the ditch. So she does say, okay, you can go have that space, but this space, no. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is um, about planting fruit trees. So um, are they asking, is it better to do it from bare roots or, or not? And any recommended local nurseries? Yes, bare root is definitely the way to go. And that's another, and maybe I should put the link in. I did a blog post on the Master Gardening website on sourcing native species and sourcing edible species like specifically fruit trees, because there is no, well, I'm a golden bough nursery, which wouldn't have anything left, is the only one that's local that you can really source from that would have the type of fruit tree you would want. Um, most of the, like the box stores and the more conventional nurseries that are around here, they get their fruit trees and pots from Oregon. And so they're just not, they're not suited for our region, really. They're not from our region. So there's Whiffle Tree is one of the ones that we get a lot of ours from and we mail order. And that's, um, so that's on the list and there's a couple of others, but again, this already, most of them are sold out. It's uh, <laughs> popular, but you can still go take a look. Thank you. Um, actually, uh, sort of a follow-up question to that person's question um, is when you are looking for native plants in nurseries, um, I know from experience that it can be a bit tricky because some things have, you know, the same name as a native species, but is really a hybrid or is really from somewhere remote. Is there, do you have any tips or, or tricks for navigating that? For 
so there's okay there's cultivars of native species so that's what you're talking about cultivars of native species yeah or, or you know things that maybe share a common name but are not really the same species <laughs> yeah I always ask for the latin name I always look at the latin name to go with a nursery that you can trust so finding a native plant nursery not any of the ones around here other than um, the one that I already mentioned. Um, because some of there's like a five and again in that blog post on buying native plants, I mentioned this, that there's five or six native species that have um, like um, the American cranberry, highbush cranberry, um, which is native, it's a great, great native shrub. But mostly if you go to a nursery, you'll get the European version because there's just, a, and there's a slight difference in the name, in that Latin name of it. So a nursery that specializes in native plants and using and specifically asking the Latin name is important. And then there's natives and native vars. And a native var is a cultivar of a native plant. And you'll see a lot of signs now. And again, this is the difference between a native nursery and a conventional nursery that sells a few native plants. A lot of the shrubs there will be cultivars of natives, so native ours. And for example, the ones with purple leaves, the insects don't like those ones. And so you're buying a native plant and not giving the wildlife the value that you would hope for by buying that native plant. And there's still a lot of research to be done on native ours. There's a few places doing some research. Anything that has double blooms um, doesn't support the pollinators. And a lot of the native, art, native cultivars have, are being bred for double blooms. Others can be equally attractive. So it's my policy now, if I have something in my yard and an exotic, so I have some non-native plants, is to watch, get to know them, see who visits. Start learning to ID the, the insects that come. And if you're not seeing any insects, if their leaves are never getting chewed, if nobody's visiting their flowers, then you may want to say, okay, goodbye and bring in somebody else. Thank you. Um, I'll just mention there is a little um, native plant nursery at uh, run by the Friends of Lemoyne Point. Yeah. As well. I mean, it's not, you know, they don't generally have so much stock that you can plant a whole forest. But especially for shrubs and trees, native shrubs and trees, that is a, another resource. Yeah, and uh, I've talked to them and hope, hoping that they might actually have little forest kits for homeowners next year. So package up some trees and shrubs that go together as a, that play well together. And lower trank conservation area as well, they've already done the main plant sale in the spring, but I think they're going to do something like that next year as well. There are, it's growing though, the number of native nurseries are growing. There's one not far from Belleville that's, that looks like it'd be worth driving down to pick up plants from. Um, Joanne, who's planting a, um, a meadow in front of um, Kingston Secondary School, she's getting like, I think a thousand plugs of native plants from that nursery. So it is becoming increasingly possible. Great. Okay, back to um, the discussion board here, the chat. Um, so here's an interesting question. For someone who has been um, logic oriented their entire life, how do you get a head start on communicating with plants and animals? <laughs> <coughs> yeah, I always considered myself kind of a touchy feely person, but I'm, that's one that I'm working on as well, <laughs> communicating with plants. And it looks like there's, there is some people that, and I think a growing number of people who kind of specialize in, um, and is there somebody in chat who's offering like a, a professional intuitive interspecies communicator? Oh man, I hadn't got that far <laughs> down. That could be. <laughs> yeah. I, I think we need to have some workshops on that. Um, I actually have collected a set of resources um, there's there's something called Gotian science, and so and this isn't like a intuitive interspecies communicator, but it's a it's a science. Like Gota is known for his poetry and for his fiction, but he had a 
more intuitive form of science where you throw off everything you know, you get outside of your rational brain and you work on um, getting to know plant and you follow it through a season. So one simple way is just choosing somebody right outside your front door. So if you don't have, if there's a weed there, if that's the only thing there, then observing it throughout the entire season from spring all the way and um, sketching it and watching it unfurl and not thinking about it, just being there with it. There's other ways like having a sit spot and just visiting your sit spot every day and trying to observe rather than think. Um, yeah, I have, and I can share the resource after. I don't know if you send out a mail out ever, but I have a set of, um, I have a newsletter and I'd include it, I, I think six different possibilities for exploring or getting to know a plant that's outside of, uh, outside of Western science. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's um, somebody, um, what's his name now? I'm blanking on him. Um, Harold, Stephen Harold Booner. And he's got a book called Plant Intelligence. And the appendix to his book is available as a PDF online. And it's a series of exercises for communicating or for getting in touch with feeling, your feeling sense with plants. And he starts with uh, something really simple. And so for all you rational people out there, have you ever walked into a room and you thought, ooh, the energy here is really bad. No one said anything yet, but you just feel that there's an energy in that room. Or you look and you look at two different buildings and one feels good and one doesn't, and you, you can't articulate why. That's your feeling sense at work. And so, he, Stephen Harold Boone kind of steps you back through those exercises and then gets you trying it with plants. So those are a couple of possibilities. Great, thank you. I'm, I'm not seeing any specific questions. There's lots of comments and people sharing resources and so on. But I, I think I might've run out of actual questions in the chat if anybody else um, does have one and wants to, to pop it in there quickly, please go ahead. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a um, a different kind of plant sale, and you're right, there is um, a wild communicator offering their help, and lots of lots of interesting things in there. I guess um, one thing that's there as well is a uh, it's more of a comment or suggestion, but um, that maybe some property owners of large spaces might allow groups to re rewild their sections of their properties, and then you could do a, a survey. Um, and maybe there could even be carbon capturing credits associated with that. Yeah, well, if anybody's interested in the forest, I pasted the link right at the beginning to the page on the Monastic Gardener site. But at the bottom of it, there's a form, a link to a form, and you can fill out that form. And we're planting four in Kingston in the fall, one at Lakeside Community Garden, one at Walking the Path, the Peace site on Highway 15 one at Champlain Park associated with Kingston Secondary School and one on Wolf Island. And for each of those, they're like range between 100 square meters and 200 square meters. The 200 square meter one, 1200 trees are being planted. But we're also looking at how do we, what is like our next meeting It's gonna be about data? What data are we collecting? What is data? How do we define data? And so phenology was one of the one of the ones we're going to be talking about because phenology and um, and so you think about the the current full moon, which is um, snow crust moon in Ojibwe, and that is a phenology that is phenology the telling time through a natural phenomena. And so when does buds break in season? In season? So we're looking at um, measuring the carbon capture or mentioned, looking at doing bio blitz to measure biodiversity. So doing a baseline, starting to track the phenology of the little forests. And then um, the four we wanna plant this year, it's just the start. So if anybody has a public space that they would like a little forest in, 
now's the time to start thinking about it and building a group that is willing to tackle the city and get the permission to do it. Oh, which link? I'll paste the link. Oh, okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you. I was just going to ask. Because the, on there, you too, you can see the, we step through the methodology and it's like, it's like a skip through a whole bunch of stages of succession. So tra traditional, you know, forest, you think about how a forest forms, the conventional kind of reforestation is you plant and there's um, and pioneer species come in and then mid species come in and finally final species. And so it takes a hundred years for these various stages of the forest to go through. With little forests, the Mayawaki method, it skips the hundred year kind of slow succession and plants all these species together and mid to late successional species. And they both compete, so they grow really fast because they're kind of going up, they're going for the sunlight and they cooperate. So with mycorrhizal networks, now that they know that trees are really, a lot of them are very community species, the sport for each other in the forest. So now anytime I walk through the city and see all these little lonely trees, I'm like, ah, you need a forest, you need some friends. That's a good, I'm just reading the book, The Hidden Life of Trees. Um, which is all about how they communicate and support each other and so on. And it makes me think the same thing now that I see all these little lonely trees without any friends. Um, yeah. And they do know that forests are more resilient. They're more resilient against pests, against climate, against like weather. They balance each other out. So really we should be having forests in our cities, not just lonely trees. Yeah. Um, I noticed that there was one. There was one more question there, um, uh, with jo asking Joyce to talk about Highway 15. What's happening there? Uh, um, so Highway 15. Highway 15. It's a reconciliation um, project between Faith United Church and the urban indigenous community. And um, and so. Hmm. It's, it's gone from, and so they, when I first started working with Maureen Buchanan, who's with the uh, Kingston Indigenous Language Nest, and now she's um, very involved with the Highway 15 effort. Um, the original was planting an upland and a lowland little forest there. And for the little forest there, the focus is really the important species, the important medicines for the Indigenous community. Maureen though now is going uh, gung ho and it's gone from little forests to being indigenous food sovereignty. So now they're also looking at um, a um, food forest and um, uh, I think 50, three sisters mounds. Um, I don't know, they've just, they're doing a lot. <laughs> so Highway 15 is one of the sites if anybody's interested in getting involved with. Um, and in that, so each site and the approach to it is slightly different. We are working together as an overall kind of group in terms of figuring out the methodology because this is the first really it's being done in Canada, but also the approach that we're, and, and the approach that we're taking in that, uh, one of the ways Maureen talks about it is helping the land remember because the land was colonized. It was really devastated. The trees were cut down. Our region is a forested region other than the Elbar area. And so helping the land remember, but then the land helping people remember. And in the case of the indigenous community, that's particularly important in the, the link to the language. Um, language is really linked to land. And without land, and a lot of that language has been lost because of the, the, this, the, well, just like we destroyed the trees, we, the colonization had a devastating impact on the people. And so with Highway 15, restoring the land and the land um, helping restore relationship with people. I don't know, is that, does that answer your question, Mary? 
That sounds like a good answer to me. Um, I have one, one question being passed from beside me here. <laughs> um, just a, a little detail about um, um, the challenges you've had with, with bylaw. Have you specifically had um, problems with complaining neighbors or city bylaw? And have, ha are there fines potentially? Um, I had two complaints and the two complaints were from the same neighbor. He actually stopped. <laughs> he was driving home and uh, one day and he stopped as I was like putting a dry stream bed through my ditch and just killing the last of the grass in my ditch. He was like, you're going to have to start taking that apart, you know, and I'm like, why? There's no law saying I have to have grass in my ditch and he's like grumble, grumble. And I said, the city came, the city's already come and they said they liked my yard. So he stopped complaining after that because he, my other neighbor had run across to tell me about him complaining another time and that the city had come. And so I'd phoned the city. And um, I suspect had he, had he actually complained that third time, the city might have made me undo the ditch because I think I am definitely breaking bylaws. And if you look at the bylaw post and maybe I'll put it in the chat, um, I'd gone to a webinar that was held by a group in Toronto, including Maureen Johnson, who's written a number of books on native plants. And there was an ecologist there who rewilded her yard because it was very steep. And then she had a bylaw complaint. And then, so then the city said to her, well, she had to apply for an exemption. So in Toronto, they have a natural yard exemption. And she's like, I'm not going to apply for an exemption because that's, that's not right. The city gave her an exemption anyway because it made the papers. And so the city wanted it to go away and she was not going to let it go away. So she's got a lawyer on side who is um, itching to take, um, to take it all the way to Ontario Supreme Court. And it turns out that there was a case back in 1990 something where it was ruled, the bylaw in Toronto was ruled unconstitutional. And um, hence Toronto introducing the natural exemption. But in my list of stuff, and we across the street actually from me, there's a ditch and the ground sink the ditch one year. And it, it is a really, really big wide ditch and it hit, hits a creek. And the previous person had mowed it and pesticide in it and herbicide in it. And then, um, he actually died and his daughter was living there and she didn't do any herbiciding and pesticiding. And then the grubs ate it like pretty quickly because it hadn't been, well, it had been, Astrid calls it, it, it was on crack. It was like on crack and then it got withdrawal and then the grubs came. And now it's like, it's really wild now. It's got, I don't know, 20 trees in there long, long, long grass and um, weeds and flowers. And our a, neighbor, a few neighbors have gone over when a new owner comes in and when the new owner started mowing, just saying, please, please don't mow the ditch. And they have never had a complaint about that ditch. And my yard hasn't had a complaint since that neighbor came. So there is the risk of a fine. If you do it, or there, there's the risk of a threat of a fine. But if that happens, you go to that blog post and you look at all the, like it's one of the things that has in the bylaw is you can't have bare earth, that you need to have it covered with a ground cover with something, for example, like periwinkle and ivy. So <laughs> that the blog post gives you ammunition to argue with the bylaw officer and the bylaw officer odds or will get confused and back away because you know more than they do. And so my response to that one would be, oh, so invasive species, those are both listed on the invasive species list of plants. So invasive species are allowed in yards. You're encouraging invasive species. And then does that mean I can plant and you can list some other invasive species? Or in the grass, like the height of eight inches, any ornamental grass breaks that. So then you can ask the bylaw officer, say, well, some of the city properties have grass that's longer than, than eight inches. Can you tell me which species of grass I'm allowed to grow longer than eight inches and which species I'm not? So you get very specific and um, odds are they'll back off. And if they don't, and if you actually are naturalizing or rewilding, 
um, you can reach out because Lorraine Johnson in Toronto and the lawyer there are looking for cases. And so I think you'd get support. Okay. No, thank you. So, um, so, so I think we probably should wrap it up because it's 8.05. Uh, it, do you see another question in there, Leslie, or are we okay? No, I don't. More um, help and, and resources and so on, but yeah. that's it, I think. Okay, well, uh, uh, people might want to actually save the chat, which I think you're allowed, you can do from your Zoom if you want. Um, anyway, I, uh, I just want to uh, thank Joyce for this absolutely fascinating uh, and wide-ranging discussion tonight, and also for all the really good questions from the uh, from our participants. Uh, I'm just going to quickly talk about next week, and uh, what, which is actually I, I realize Easter Monday. So Easter Monday at seven o'clock, uh, we're having Jeremy Malloy talking about cities acting for climate justice. Uh, and that's where maybe Kingston can learn some things about other municipal governments around the world. Jeremy knows an awful lot about all of this. Um, so uh, we look forward to seeing you all uh, next week at the same time. Uh, and can I say to whoever the uh, person who communicates with plants, email yeah. me? <laughs> I'm typing my email address in the chat. So if anybody's... Uh, all right. Okay. So that person uh, will will uh, try to follow up, and we'll also follow up about this newsletter that you were talking about. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. The well, the little forest has a newsletter, so that's started. The other newsletter I've got a website, which I really don't update. The website called Rewild um, RewildMyCity.com, and that has a newsletter. Yeah. Okay. So okay. great. All right. Thank, thank you very you much, all. Joyce. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. It was fun. <laughs> <laughs>